Yeah, I'm ready. Thanks. Okay, let's get going. Um, good to see you all. Okay, so um, we are very close to the end of the semester now, so um, we have this lecture, then we have the practical on Wednesday, then we have a final class a week today, next Monday, which is the last day of classes, and um, we have a number of presentations then to just make sure to get everyone, uh, give everyone a chance to make presentations, so we'll see. Uh, maybe we'll just do the presentations, and if we have a bit of time, I might talk about something that I've been doing. Um, I don't know what, but I might think of something. <laughs> um, and that's pretty much it. The, uh, the final projects, um, I said that I wanted to try and wanted to get the reports in by the week, a week, one week after the final class. Mm -hmm. So that would be May 9th. Um, so that's... That's what we're heading for. I hope you're all doing okay on those for now. Any questions? Okay. So, this lecture um, is about source separation, the idea of um, isolating individual signals from a sound mixture. And it's kind of, it's a very sort of big and long-standing challenge in all kinds of audio processing. Uh, in a way, it's actually the most difficult for music signals because music signals, it seems one of the way, one of the things that we do when we make music is we sort of, one of the properties of music is sort of playing with uh, our hearing system's ability to, to to hear out individual sources, as we'll see. So it turns out that trying to, trying to separate out the sources of music is maybe harder than in environmental situations, but it's a, there's, a, there's a single process that allows us to do this. So I'll talk a little bit about just what, I, what we mean by source separation and what the problem is. And then there's an approach called spatial filtering, which is taking advantage of the fact that sounds from different places in space will have slightly different waveforms at different points in space, and you can try and use that as a basis for filtering the sounds. I'll talk about time frequency masking, which is a very popular approach in recent years, where you basically take a spectrogram and try and pick out the different parts of the spectrogram that correspond to different signals, and then modify the spectrogram to just preserve one part of the signal, and then resynthesize it. But it you still have to have the, the you have to solve the problem of how you decide which part of the spectrogram you want to keep. So I'll talk briefly about model-based separation, which is where you try and express what it is about a particular source that defines it as a separate source, and then try and use that as a way to pick out the parts of the, of the signal you're going to keep and resynthesize. This is something that um, one of the areas that we've done research on in my group. Um, but I'm also going to be talking about the work of a lot of, a lot of other people. It's a fairly active area and you know, a fairly attractive challenge. OK, so what are we talking about? And what, is, what do we mean by sources? What do we mean by separation? These are, you can try and define them physically. You can say, well, there's one you know, speaker or something, some physical process defining, producing sound over here. And there's another one over here. And, when we measure the sound pressure at a particular point, it's the combination of the effects of those two sources. But it's actually quite difficult to uh, really pin that down. If I, so for instance, think about the sound of a car engine. Right? Most of us would recognize the sound of a car driving by as a source. But of course, it isn't just one point source that's generating that sound. There are hundreds of components in the car in the engine, which are vibrating, which are generating radiating sound, 
And so, and if you know, if you were a mechanic and you were listening for some particular problem with a a valve or something, you might distinguish in in your mind and in your ear between the sound of the valve and other parts of the engine. And so, when we talk about the source components in a sound, it's very much a subjectively defined task that we're talking about. It, it only you can only, the only really w real way to make sense of that is to ask a person what they hear. So here's an example, here's a sound example which I like to use, which is, uh, it actually was recorded off the radio in a, in a database that we have. So. Tonight, the hapless prey was engulfed in a burning rage. Of course, that was before I got my car's air conditioning service at Arco's Smog Road. Okay, so that's a, a radio commercial. This is a spectrogram of it. And uh, we can see that, you know, so the, we can see these regions of energy, the stuff going on. But when we look at the spectrogram, it's basically this sort of single smooth surface, right? You can, you can maybe see in here that there's sort of there's some kind of background thing going and there's sort of these foreground pieces in, in front. But if you zoom in, there's no real distinction between those. It sort of look, it works out quite well here just because the color mapping makes the background look yellow, whereas the foreground is strong enough to look kind of red. But they're really just you know, different heights, ridges on, on this single surface. When we listen to that, we get a very, very clear and you know, seemingly unambiguous perception of all these separate pieces, right? So as the guy talking, at the beginning, there's some sort of uh, noise going on in the background, some sort of rumble, and then there's this change. The, the there's the choir, the sort of the choir and the, the harp or something, the strings playing, and the guy speaking, and they're all separate sources. And you know, you could con you could construct these psychological tests where, you, well, for instance, you could say, you know, what note is the is the harp playing? What note is the choir singing? And people could go in and solve that. They could they could. They could match the note of those different sources, showing that they're hearing those sources as separate things, and they're giving them separate attributes, right? They're, 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 they're taking the single sound mixture and then breaking it up into these different percepts, these different things, with different perceived sources, each of which has distinct properties. So that's the, that's the problem. That's, that's where we get this from. And of course, the, the reason it's a problem is because then you sort of try and do the same thing on the computer and you say, okay, computer, you know, tell me what the guy was saying with the speech recognizer or something. And the computer says, well, there's all this stuff here. I'm trying to fit a word to this mixture of voice plus, you know, plus harp plus, plus choir, and it doesn't fit very well. And the computer just totally messes it up because it isn't, doesn't have, there's no natural way for it to say, oh, you want me to recognize the voice? That's this part, right? It's, there's just one chunk of energy here and it's just trying to say, well, sure, I can try and match, but, but it's not, I can't, there's no, there's no simple way to distinguish between these different things that are going on. So that's why, that's one reason you might want to be able to do it, but I don't know if you've ever tried to use a, a, a telephone voice recognition system when you're in a noisy, noisy space, but it becomes very hard because, you know, the far end, here's the background noise, here's your voice, doesn't know how to tell them apart. Um, so one way that we, one thing we can do to help tell these things apart is um, listen for the uh, properties that tell us which direction the sound is coming from. So this was something that was covered last week in Anthony's presentation. The fact is we have two ears and a sound, a particular source, will have a different waveform at the two ears just because the, 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 the channel, what's happened to the, the source signal between leaving the source and reaching your ear is different for the two ears just because there's different paths involved. Obviously, if the, if the source is exactly in front of you and if your head and ears are exactly symmetric, which to first order for humans they're sort of meant to be, um, then the source would be identical to the two ears, right? That it, in theory, uh, you would you know, because of the symmetry of the situation. But for anything, anything else, um, you'd expect to see a, diff a distinction, a difference between the signal and two ears, which at the very least 
would give you information about something about where the sound was coming from. It turns out even on the, I think this is the median plane, or maybe the sagittal plane, I can't remember, but this plane, right, where it's exactly symmetric, even there people can distinguish elevation. They can tell which direction it's, it's in, which is interesting, but it's something to do with how the ear reflects sounds. But for sounds that are on, the, on this plane, maybe this is the median plane, um, there's a very clear difference between what happens to the sound when it comes to two ears. And so here's an example, which is similar to what we saw last week. If you have a single source, and this is like a, a voice source or something, a periodic or pseudo-periodic signal, and then you record it, you know, put it off to one side and record what happens to the left and right ears, I guess this, act, this uh, figure is turned around. But on one ear, you're going to see a, a more, you know, on the nearer ear, so that's why it's turned around. So here it should be the red ear that's larger and earlier because the signal here goes straight to that ear, so it, it arrives sooner. The signal to this ear has a longer path. If you sort of think about what happens, there's sort of the sound waves and they have to diffract around. <coughs> so the actual path difference is kind of like this sort of quarter diameter plus this straight path difference. And also, in the process of doing that, they sort of lose some energy, or some of the energy doesn't diffract as efficiently. So you get a lower amplitude, right? So you get a signal like this, where you have one waveform which is larger and a little bit advanced in time, and one waveform which is small, slightly smaller in amplitude. It's not just amplitude. It's also got a different shape, because different frequency components have been attenuated by different amounts. And it's a little bit delayed. You can see that the red is slightly later. You know, the zero crossings occur slightly later. And so by analyzing the differences in timing and the differences in amplitudes in different frequency bands, the ear has quite a lot of information to decide which direction the sound is coming from. And in fact, if it were just amplitude and... So if it were just time difference, if I take exactly the same signal and delay it by a few <coughs> tenths or maybe a few hundredths of a, of a millisecond between one ear, you get a very strong sense of the sound moving from side to side. Similarly, if you just change amplitude, take the same signal, but you just scale it to make it louder in one ear compared to the other, you also get a sense of it moving from side to side. The, the ear and the ear-brain system is very um, opportunistic and flexible. If there are multiple cues available, it'll try and use whatever information is good. And so in both those cases, the signal where you've got a pure time difference or signal where you've got a pure level difference, then they're not particularly realistic because normally if a sound moves from side to side, I get both a time difference and a level difference. But the brain will use either, and in fact it will use both. And you can set up these situations where you have the timing difference as if it was coming from over there, but the level difference as if it was coming from over there, right? So you make the, this ear earlier, but this ear louder. And people will sort of say, oh, it's sort of coming from the middle, that there's some there's some trading that can go on between these different cues that the ear will sort of, the brain will try and make the most of it. Although sometimes what will happen is it'll sound like, well, it's sort of coming from this, it's no, it's no longer coming from an, a narrow point, it's sort of spread out in space. There's this idea of a diffuse sound. So there's lots of experiment, experiments you can do. But anyway, the brain is using this spatial information. And then if you have a mixture of two sources, they come from different directions. You can do experiments like you can synthesize these, say, two voices, and you can put the two voices on top of each other and see how loud one voice has to be before you can't make out what the other voice is saying. And you separate them in space, and people get better because they can use this, this separation. This percept they, they hear the sounds coming from two different directions. They can focus their attention on a particular direction, and they're better at picking out that particular sound. So... This is, a, you know, this is a, a, a well-studied area, both psychologically and in terms of computer models, and it clearly is a, a good source of information for separating sources. But that's not the whole story, because, of course, I can take a couple of sources, so a couple of signals, mix them together, and play them through a single speaker. So there's no spatial information available anymore. Or equivalently, you're listening to something, you can block up one ear, so you can no longer get the spatial information. 
your ability to understand the different sources doesn't fall apart. You know, you definitely, it's kind of an interesting thing to do to, you know, suddenly turn off one of your ears by blocking it. Um, you, in many situations, you'll experience a reduction in your ability to pick out the different sources, but you can still definitely make, make, make sense of them. So what are you using then? If you've only got a single waveform, but you're, trying, but you're able to figure out that it's made of several components, it's kind of an ill-defined problem, right? Because, well, it, you may think that it's several components, but it could just be the single sound source that happens to have that particular complex waveform. In a sense, if you're listening to a sound being played over a single speaker, it really is just a single sound source. It's the little speaker cone kind of moving backwards and forwards that's making the sound. But you're going to hear it, like you know, in that radio example, you're going to hear it as multiple things because your brain says, well, yeah, maybe it's a speaker, but clearly what this signal is about is the, you know, this recording of this guy and these musical instruments. The brain decides that that's the kind of interesting analysis, and so that's what it does. So there's, there's this whole uh, mechanism in the, in the brain about taking a sound like that and decomposing it in different sources. And that's known as, that was called auditory scene analysis by Al Bregman, who was uh, he's a psychologist who pu published his book like 20 years ago now called Auditory Scene Analysis. And he was talking, he was thinking about how there's, there'd been a lot of work in vision where people talked about scene analysis, where people look at a picture and they break it up in, into individual objects. And he was making the observation that the same thing happens in audition. And what, the only thing you've got available is something about the signal. So you're listening to the signal, and you're picking out different parts of the signal, and they make you perceive it as different, separate things. And the kinds of things you use are onset. So if we know that the, we know the ear breaks up the signal into different frequency bands, but if you, and it will sort of, you know, the hair cells will respond to energy in different frequency bands. But if the energy in different frequency bands all starts at the same time, has common onset, then it probably, then it's perceived as probably coming from the same source. Similarly, harmonicity, if we have a bunch of energy in different frequency bands, but they're harmonics of a common fundamental, then, well, rather than hearing those as separate sinusoids, we're going to hear those as fused together in a single complex tone. And there are various other things you can talk about, but these are kind of like the obvious, very natural properties you want to use. This is an example that's about investigating some of that process. Um, and it was uh, developed by these guys, Reynolds and McAdams, working at, at Stanford in, in the 70s, I think. Um, what happens here is it's just a harmonic stack, right? A set of harmonics that start off. And then so we hear that as a kind of single rich tone. But then what happens is the even numbered harmonics start to modulate in frequency, where the odd-numbered harmonics don't. They stay flat. And normally, this kind of common modulation is like, well, probably these frequency components are related because they're all changing their frequencies at the same, set by the same amount, proportionally, at the same time. But these ones, which aren't, probably aren't related. And so by the end of the sound, your brain is sort of saying, well, actually, there's two things going on here. There's these stationary tones and these modulated tones. And the modulated tones, because they're uh, 2F0, 4F0, 6F0, they themselves form a um, plausible set of harmonics of a fundamental which is 2F0, right, rather than the fundamental. So what we hear is this thing where it, um, you hear the second tone coming out. Let's see what, see what you can hear. So it starts off kind of sounding like this one tone, but then you hear this sort of this modulating, this vibrato pitch an octave higher coming in. So this is just a sort of what would the brain do with this, right? Because at the beginning it's sort of decided that it's one tone, and then it has to go back and change that decision. The brain, you know, maybe maybe you can fool it once it's made the decision, it's going to stick to it. No, it's sort of it. It says, oh, I guess I was wrong before, and doesn't, doesn't seem particularly d bothered by this. But that's kind of, now it's like, well, that's kind of a complex system that's having to make these decisions and then be able to change them in the view of developing information. So it's kind of a 
that you know a lot of there's a lot of work in trying to characterize and describe and sort of figure out the right models for this system. This is what um, this is how Bregman introduces the problem of auditory scene analysis, um, just to sort of get, give people the right analogy. He says, imagine two narrow channels dug up from the edge of a lake with handkerchiefs stretched across each one. So you've got these little membranes across the, uh, the, the, the water. Looking only at the motion of the handkerchiefs, you are to answer questions such as how many boats are there on the lake? Where are they? You know, what kind of boats are they? And so this is because, of course, the lake is the, the, the acoustic medium, air. The two channels are our ear canals, and the two handkerchiefs are the eardrums. All the brain knows about is how the eardrums vibrated. But from that, we're able to figure out a lot of information by looking at the slight differences in the ripples. By looking at the ripples and then looking at differences in the ripples, we can figure out, you know, what the boats are and where they are and things like that. Of course, this is a two-dimensional problem. In hearing, it's actually a three-dimensional problem, so it's even worse. But even that makes it seem pretty tough. So um, the bottom line at this point is that there is a very active research area in this auditory scene analysis trying to figure out how people respond to uh, particular sounds, how they understand them as coming from different sources, but we, we don't really know yet. It's sort of, it's, a, it's one of those, you know, like any high, any complex brain function, it's not a single answer, right? It's a lot of different things that the brain uses to put together a robust system that can uh, help us get information out of the world. Okay, so, well, one thing we can look at to try and understand how this source separation works is um, how we go about creating mixtures, things that are perceived as being uh, multiple sound sources. And in music, the most, you know, what we, what, the way we do this is in, in mix down. We take, you know, if, we, if we're creating a piece of music, um, you know, with multiple instruments, the way it's typically done is you'll record the different instruments on separate channels and, you know, somehow, and then you'll create a single Final mix down by combining the different the different instruments together, just by adding their waveforms, perhaps with some processing. Um, we like to listen to stereo music, um, where which means we have music coming out of two channels, the left and the right speaker. And there is this more or less this ability to control the perceived positioning of the sound coming out of these speakers by crossfading between the two speakers, called panning. And all panning does is it just changes the relative level of the two speakers. And it has a, a law like this. These are two, uh, this is you know, a cosine and a sine function, if you like, a quarter of those waveforms. And uh, by having a, a pan function such that you take, the, uh, you know, take a single source and then send it to the left speaker with the, with the value from the blue curve and to the right speaker with a value from the red curve, then the total power delivered by the two speakers, which is the sum of the squares of their amplitudes, the total power is constant because these two curves, when you square them and add them, they, they give you one. But the, rel but the relative le level between the two speakers varies from all left to all right. And depending on where you're sitting, if you're sitting in a sort of equilateral triangle arrangement with the speakers, you get a very uh, pretty compelling, pretty convincing perception of the sound moving from left to right. If it's equal on both speakers, you hear it in the middle. If it's on this speaker, obviously you hear it at this speaker. And if it's somewhere in between, you can hear it as more or less in between. And then you can combine multiple instruments, multiple tracks with different pan settings to get uh, a stereo image, to get a sense of the different instruments in different points in space and separated from one another. Um, when we talked about, when I sh told you about you know, the sound coming through two different ears, we said there's a level difference from the head shadowing, effectively, and a time difference from the path difference. Here, we're not able to control the time difference. We, it would be difficult with these two speakers to have one signal that arrived 
at one ear and then another signal which arrives slightly later at a different ear because, of course, both ears are getting signals from both speakers. You could imagine trying to do that by having something that cancelled, but it would be very, very delicate to where you were standing. But because the head shadowing says, well, mostly this ear gets more of this speaker than this speaker, we can control the level difference, and that's relatively uh, robust for different points, different points of listening. And because of this Q flexibility, even though it's only the level difference that you're changing, you still, the, the listener still experiences the, uh, the panning effect, the positioning effect. Um, of course, we're now moving away from two speakers to systems with more speakers, like uh, maybe five speakers. A five-speaker system, like a surround sound system, has an extra speaker in the middle, just because very often that's the, the sound you want to use. And so it's nice to be able to have a speaker which is actually positioned where you're getting most of your sources coming from. And then we'll have a couple more speakers at the back to give you five speakers. Then it's like, well, how do you control positioning then? It turns out that the easiest thing to do is just to take, if you want to, if you want to have a sound coming from a particular point, you take the two nearest speakers and then just do panning between those. There are more complex things you can imagine trying to do, but that actually works pretty well. Just treat them as a set of pairs of speakers and do panning between them. All right, so that's something about um, what we mean by sources, what we, why we have a perception of different sources. I don't know about why, but you know, some of the factors that lead to our perceptions of different sources, the spatial cues, but also these kind of signal intrinsic structures that just make it sound like a, a, a particular source. And then some of the ways we can try and control how those sources are perceived in space. Now we can move on to looking at the, the converse of that problem, which is kind of what we're here to talk about. The, the idea of taking a sound that has multiple sources in it and trying to pick out the individual pieces. And so the, the first thing we can look at is this idea of spatial filtering. And here we assume that we have multiple sensors. So we've got M sensors, meaning M microphones. And then we've got sound that's generated by some number of sources. And we don't know how many sources there are. We can vary the number of microphones there are, the number of sensors there are. And so we've got these two dimensions to the problem. The number of microphones is essentially the number of degrees of freedom. Right, that we, for every time we have a microphone, we have an extra kind of dimension to the sound waveform that we're looking to the sound problem we're dealing with. And it turns out that, that the more the more sensors we have, the more processing we can do. It turns out that actually, um, under the well, we'll see what happens. So look at this. We have let's say we've got two microphones, and I've drawn these are meant to be microphones, and I've drawn them sort of in this crossed pair arrangement, which is actually the same arrangement you see on this little recorder here. The thing about this is that if you, this arrangement is, if you look at it as a two-dimensional problem, right, so if you forget the height dimension, then these microphones are almost, they're almost at the same point in space. They're different microphones, but they're sort of, their center of sensitivity is sort of coincident. That means that um, it, the, the, the timing differences, the differences due to different path levels, the path distances from a particular source to the microphone, they can be made very small, right? That if, it really, if they really were at the same point in space, then the waveform would reach them, both microphones at the same time. Of course, if they really were at the same point in space, they would sort of have to record the same signal because they, there wouldn't be any difference between what they were picking up. But by putting them at different points, you can build these microphones which are actually, you know, a microphone is detecting the variation in air pressure, but it isn't a, a single point in space. It actually is like a diaphragm. It's a flat thing that, like the, the eardrum, it's a, it's a flat structure that experiences air pressure. So it samples air pressure primarily in one direction, right? Air pressure is not, pressure is not a, a vector quantity. It's a scalar quantity because what it is, it's like how dense the air particles are, so how, rap how much force they exert when they bounce around. But they don't exert force preferentially in one direction. They exert it isotropically, the same in all directions. But the... But against a... Uh, if there's a physical obstacle, then suddenly it's like, well, 
now it's all pushing in one direction. Uh, no, my, my acoustics is not great. But you can build these microphones such that they uh, will respond to sound coming from a particular direction and not from another direction. So these shapes here, that's called the cardioid, frequent, cardioid spatial response for a microphone because it kind of looks like a heart. And it's a, it's a, you know, you can build microphones with different responses, but this is a very common one. So that if the sound's coming from directly behind the microphone, it's sort of it, it's unresponsive, and it's directly in front, it's most responsive, and then off to the side, it has some sort of intermediate response. So if you have these two microphones, they're directional microphones. They 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 pick up sound better from a particular direction. They're pointing in different directions, but they're as near as we can make it in, at the same point in space. And you have these two sources at different directions off in space. What the microphones will record is, well, they'll both record contributions from both sources. And because they're very close in time, they'll sort of, they'll more or less be in phase. So the sources will be uh, instantaneously mixed, that is, we say. There's no, we can just think about this at each point in time. The microphone signal M1 of, at T is some proportion of S1 of T and S2 of T. But the mixing gains, the actual proportions of these, will be different for the two microphones. So for the microphone pointing up here, the source 1, it intersects its sensitivity curve here, so it has some gain here. But source 2 is further off axis, so it has a lower gain, A22 here. And then M1 has two different gain factors, right? So you can sort of see it because they're pointing in different directions, they hear different amounts of two signals. So we can write this whole situation in this nice linear algebra form where we have two sources, S1 and S2. We have two microphone signals, M1 and M2, and these are all varying with time, but we've, by construction, we've tried to pull the time axis out of it so that it's, it happens, it's, it's true at every time, time point. And then we've got this square matrix of, um, of gains, which just say that M1 is A11 times S1 plus A12 times S2, and M2, the microphone 2 signal, is A21 times S1, the gain from this microphone to this point, this value here, plus A22 times S2, this value here times this signal. Okay. So then we've got a nice M equals A times S, a square uh, matrix here. So we can actually, if we want to, if we, the microphones are what we get, the signals are what we want, if we could find the inverse of this A matrix, then we just apply that inverse to these two microphone signals, and we get the source signals back. So, you know, all that argument about the setup, just so that we can write this as this nice, familiar vector matrix equation, which now has this very precise answer. I mean, this is saying, well, as long as you get A right, as long as you can take its inverse, then you can exactly recover S1 and S2 from these two signals, which were both mixtures of, of S1 plus S2. So this, is, this gets us back to this, this argument about the number of sources and number of sensors, the degrees of freedom argument. We could, have made, we could have made this matrix any shape, right? We could have had multiple sources. We could have multiple microphones, and then the matrix has got as many rows as we've got microphones and as many columns as we've got sources. But if we want to take its inverse, then we require it, well, if you want to take its inverse straight up, we need, we need it to be square. So we need the number of sources to be equal to the number of microphones. And if we want it to be invertible, such that um, we get, that we can find even a, a single answer, we need it to be full rank, which means that we need to make sure that there are at least as many rows as there are columns. We can have more rows than columns, right? So we could have extra microphones in here. We could put a third and fourth microphone in. Then we, we're into this funny realm where we have to use this so-called pseudo-inverse to solve it. But there is a, a best solution here. And actually, uh, you, as you'd imagine, using more microphones is going to give you a better solution in this case. But if we have more columns than microphones, so if we have three sources and two microphones, then there are, there, you know, we, we're trying to get 
We're trying to get three things out of two things. It's under constrained. There's a, there's a whole space of solutions that are equally valid, that are all perfect solutions, and we can't decide amongst them. So that's the uh, limitation. Of course, that's the situation we're in, right? We've got two microphones, two samples of the spatial field. We've got an uncontrolled number of sources, but rarely just two. But we still have to figure out what's going on. But you can build systems, you know, that's so the humans have difficulty taking advantage of this ideal um, spatial filtering situation. But you can build systems with, with very many microphones. And so there are these systems where they use, you know, hundreds even of, of microphones. And then they can, then you can come up with these uh, ideal solutions where you really should be able to get very good performance. So um, just to work that through, here's an example of what it really means to do this inverse um, inverse spatial filtering. So let's say we've got two sources, S1 and S2, and mic one, here's you know, S1 with a gain of one, or whatever, you can normalize it to have a gain of one, and then it has S2 with half the gain. And mic two has S2 with a normalized gain of one, but here's S1 with only 0.8, right? So that's sort of similar to the situation in the previous um, slide. That's what we're saying. Here's M1, S1 plus 0.5 S2, M2, 0.8 S1 plus S2. So, you know, we can eliminate the, uh, we can eliminate one of these S2s. So, for instance, M1 minus 0.5 M2, the S2 disappears and we're just left with S1. So, that's, so this is what that's saying is that one row of the inverse of this matrix is 1, 0.5, of course. If we take the inverse, we know that's true, or something like that. There's some scaling involved. But that's what that's how you that's what it means to take the inverse of a two by two matrix is basically to do this just elimination of the variables on both on both rows. So that means that if in the case of instantaneous mixing, some combination of M1 and M2 with some relative gain factor will resolve to giving you just one signal. Of course, if it's most values give you some combination of both signals, but there will be one particular ratio between them that will give you just S1, and one particular ratio that will give you just S2. Um, that's a fairly easy thing to, to try. And so you have, this leads to this kind of classic um, audio processing thing, or music signal processing thing where you have um, a stereo signal, you know, your, whatever you're recording from, from CD or whatever, and you um, subtract one channel from the other to see what you get out. So this is what we're going to be doing on Wednesday, trying out some versions of this. But here's a simple, a simple instance. Um, so what we can do here is we can load a sound file. Uh, hang on. So this is so it turns out that stereo recording was introduced, was made pop, became popular in the 1960s. Right, that was when they first had, um, when they first developed technology to actually release records that would play in stereo, LPs. And so the Beatles were amongst the first artists to use stereo recording. And of course, the, the technology hadn't really been explored very much at that point. And so they tended to use it in a very simple way. And so the Beatles recording is kind of interesting for playing with this because they tend to have really dramatic panning where they'll put all the instrument, you know, they'll put instrument just on the left channel or just on the right channel or on a mixture between the two. So let's see. So this is a Beatles track, and this is, I'm listening to left plus right. I've mixed it down to a, to a mono signal here, single channel, I just added the two signals together, which sort of is what you classically listen to. Okay, if I move this across, I can listen to just the left channel, and you can see that the, the piano is on the left channel, but there are no drums there on the right. It's the opposite, it's just the drums and the voice and no piano. 
But then we can do the, the thing of subtracting left from right. And now the vocals, which are mixed into the left and the right channels equally, when we subtract the two, we cancel out the vocals and we just get the two remaining instruments. So, you know, just with a single dimension, which is basically changing the ratio between left and right, we can pull out a range of different uh, mixes of that signal, just to show you what's happening here. All I'm doing is um, taking the single value, which is, you know, my mix between left and right, um, adding, so this is, I guess, between... minus one and one. I'm adding like a, a quarter to make it between minus three quarters and one and a quarter, multiplying it by pi, and taking the cosine and sine terms, and then multiplying my left and right signals by those things and adding them together. So basically I'm starting with a cosine and sine curve. All right, this is the sine curve, this is the cosine curve. I start at a quarter cycle, which is where they would be equal, and then I just move backwards and forwards, and I get all values between, you know, one value one, one value zero, um, one value one, one value minus, one value zero, one value minus one, et cetera. So I can get the sort of full range of ratios between them, like that. Yeah. There, there were some artifacts there, but actually, um, what's happening? So yeah, it depends how you've done, done, done the actual mixing. This thing here, this play sound stereo, um, I tried to make it so it'll handle MP3 files because it's, you know, it's just a pain to have to convert everything to WAV before you want to load it into PD. So there's this PD thing, there's this PD unit called MP3 Play, um, which does, you know, reads an MP3 file and plays it, which is nice, but it's a really ropey implementation, so it keeps dropping frames and generating little whistles. So actually, we, uh, if you listen to it even just straight up, there it's got these artifacts in, but they're not particularly from the recording, they're just from the MP3, the PD's MP3 player. But, um, but in general, yes, that's the thing that, you know, if, if I have this signal which is basically just the same in left and right, um, I listen to left and right, I'm going to hear it as being the single source. If I subtract left from right, then if there's any slight difference between the two channels, suddenly that's all I've got left. So actually, uh, let's just, for illustration, let's, oops, don't do that. Let, let's listen to um, this different signal, which is now this is Suzanne Vega. I guess it was recorded in the mid-80s or something. Um, it's also a very sparse mix, but now it's the, the studio technology has moved on a little bit. So now if we... If we listen to the difference of the left and right channels, I'm waiting for the voice to come in. If we, okay. That's, that's the center, but here's the difference. You can hear a bit of the voice, but what you're actually hearing is the, is the reverb, right? That there's, that when they mixed it, they added a little bit of, of artificial reverb, the reverb was diffuse so that it was different in left and right channels. And so now you hear that residual. And so that's like you don't really hear the reverb at all in the original mix because it's kind of subtle. But when you cancel out the voice, suddenly you're left with all these bits that are now unmasked and they're suddenly very clear. And so if there was any kind of slight phase difference in the high frequency, you'd also hear that. Yeah. OK, well, well, we'll get to play with that more on on Wednesday. And you can try it on different signals. It's kind of, I don't know, I find it <laughs> very uh, engaging to, to take signals that you take music that you know and then play with the mix by, by cancelling out these different things. Well, that's great, um, you know, when you've got this kind of interactive thing and you can use your ear to sort of move it around and decide what you can, um, when, you, when you're getting a particular proportion of what you want. But if you want to do this automatically, you want to have a system where you can just play in these signals and have it pick out these different parts, you know, you can't have a human, you can't, you'd like to have a system where you didn't have to have a human there telling you when you got it right. <laughs>
And so the, it's like, well, what, are you gonna, what does it mean? What, how do you know if you got the right answer? Well, you sort of, if you got the right answer, it sounds like you're just hearing one source. But how do you, tell, how do you make the machine decide whether it's hearing just one source? There was this very nice uh, idea that came up in the early to mid-90s um, to do as a way of, of quantifying that. And it, it led to this series of algorithms called Independent Component Analysis, or ICA. So here's the situation. We've got you know, the same thing with the microphones, and we think that there's some two by two, you know, if it was a two, two microphone, two source case, we've got this two by two estimate of the inverse matrix, which if we multiplied it would give us the two sources. But how do we know if we got it right? Well, we can look at, the, we can look at some comparison between these sources and then update update these um, parameters to try and optimize this parameter, this measure of the comparison between two sources. And the, the, the concept is, if you have a signal which is a mixture of two sources, then if you look at, the, if you look at one signal, you know something about the other signal. If you've got these two signals which are maybe different mixtures, but they're different mixtures of the same two sources, well, if you know one of them, then you know quite a lot about the other one because it's just going to be the same components but with different gains. But if you have a situation where you've got one source in one channel and the other source in the other channel, and they're different sources, then knowing what this one is doesn't really tell you anything about this. You assume that the property of what makes them different sources is that they're statistically independent. The variation in one doesn't tell you anything about the variation in the other. And the way we can measure statistical independence turns out that you can, you, know, you can look at correlation, but correlation doesn't quite do it here. You're looking for independence, statistical dependence above second order. But if you look at something like mutual information, and there are a number of ways of calculating mutual information, but basically how many bits of information does knowing the value of one of these outputs tell me about the other? In a situation where these things are both mixtures, then knowing about knowing one tells you something about the other, in the one situation where you've exactly balanced them so that you've cancelled out one source from both channels, then you have a minimum in the amount of information you're getting about the other. And so one way you can measure this is with the kurtosis, which is the fourth moment of the distributions, normalized by the standard deviation and the mean, and normally normalized with three because uh, of the, the fourth moment, the normalized fourth moment of a Gaussian is three. So if we if we define it this way, then the kurtosis of the Gaussian distribution is zero. And then, so here's an actual scatter plot of a mixture of two signals. And you know, I've got the two microphone signals, mix one and mix two. And then for every time, and I've got some sources going into these two microphones. And then for every time point, I take the microphone one and microphone two and plot a point here. And this is actually a real, a real situ situation. What you see is these two rays going through here. And what's happened is that sometimes one of the signals is close to zero. This is very common, especially for speech, that there'll be these gaps. But the other signal is not, is non-zero. And it turns out that the other signal is mixed into the two microphones with this sort of slope. So that when it's, you know, it gets this much faster for microphone two and this much faster for microphone one. And then you have the converse situation where that source is zero, but the other source is mixed in, and then you get this other slope. And so just by sort of looking at these you can actually see the two components because there were these cases where there was basically only one, there were these time slices where there's only one signal present. What that means is if I take this two-dimensional scatter and then project it onto the normal of one of these rays, then this signal basically gets projected away to zero. It always projects down to zero. And all we're left with is the, the other signal, which actually is also being kind of made smaller, but it's not, but it still has a non-zero projection onto this axis. Then there's this other normal here, the normal to this ray, and now this signal, when it projects onto this, will have a non-zero residual. So actually, the, the space of all the possible two-by-two two unmixing matrices is basically parameterized by a single parameter, which is the angle here, the angle that this normal is, is pointing in, <coughs> which is also why we just need a single slider to try all the possible values of mixing the two channels together. So then what you can do is, <coughs> for every possible projection, you calculate this kurtosis, then you plot this kurtosis as a function of the, the angle, the direction of that, of that normal, 
and this is what you see, there are two points where you get local maxima in the kurtosis of the project, predict, projection. And they correspond to the cases where you have the two isolated signals being, being returned. So that's actually, <coughs> excuse me, that's um, a blind way of varying this parameter, sort of adapting this parameter to find the point where you pull out separate signals. Okay. So this is kind of a very simplified case because the parameter space we're searching is just one dimension. But it, it illustrates the point that there is this kind of local optimum. Now there are two because it turns out that the, the kurtosis itself is not normalized. The kurtosis of one signal is smaller than the kurtosis of, of the other. But the, the, the key factor is that it's a local optimum, right? That there's a, there's a value in between these two. So you can find these two things as, uh, as well-defined solutions to the problem. And then for higher dimensions, you have more, you can't now search over one dimension, you might have like you know, multiple dimension that you have to search across, but you can still basically do this gradient descent or gradient ascent where you try and find some set of the values that, um, that maximizes your measure of the independence between the signals you get out, and that is your, um, that is your solution. You, you can, and that's the, the family of ICA, independent components analysis, algorithms is just different ways of measuring this independence and then different ways of trying to do the search for the best solution. But they're all basically working on the same principle. And they can work really well uh, when, when you have problems that match this situation. Um, <clears throat> Another way that we can um, try and separate out signals is uh, to use the spatial structure, the fact that you've got the um, signals coming from different directions will have different uh, channels. In particular, you can think about the fact they're going to have different path lengths and so different timing relationships. And so we said that you, know, you can use, you can think about that whole original setup of this mixing matrix and trying to find its inverse and, you know, do the best solution. Um, if you want to decide which direction the signal is coming from, then it's kind of hard. You actually have to look at the signal and figure it out. But you might want to just build this microphone, which you say, well, I'm going to point it directly at a particular source, and then I just want it to make sure it has the most gain in that direction, and signals coming from any other direction will be attenuated. So one way you can do this is by having an array of microphone elements that have some particular geometry and then combining, this, combining those signals in some, in some scheme. So here's, and there are, you know, because basically this is like the space of all possible ways of filtering a set of signals and adding them together, there are a lot of different solutions to this. But here's the simplest possible case, which actually turns out to be um, very effective. So if you have a set of regularly spaced microphone elements, such that the distance between them, dx, is... Um, corresponds to a delay. So if we have a, sing a single wave front moving this way, it's going to hit each of these microphone elements in turn. And then if, if the speed of sound is C, then they're gonna, it's going to hit them each D seconds apart. If we take the outputs of those microphones and then delay them such that this microphone, after it's been delayed by D, will now be exactly in phase with the output of this microphone, which is when it actually hits, has the same waveform hitting it, but delayed by the propagation delay. And then you do this and you sum them up. What happens is for sounds coming from exactly the right direction, the direction this is pointing in, they'll all be aligned and so they'll reinforce. For sounds coming from any other direction, the timing difference won't quite be D, it'll be slightly less than D. And so now when we add them up, they won't quite be in phase and we'll get some, we'll, we won't get as much phase reinforcement as we do for the sounds in the, in the appropriate direction. And so what you end up with is a distance-dependent gain, which you can plot as a, in this polar diagram. And so here, and then it, of course it depends on the actual frequency of the sound, because the amount of cancellation you get depends on what the phase difference is, what phase difference the delay of D or whatever it is, less than D, corresponds to. Um, 
so that you get, you get this frequency dependent thing, but you get this, for a given frequency, you can get a, a response like this. So here, uh, the blue curve is this cardioid curve, where it just happens that um, for this, in this case, the wavelength was one quarter of the spacing between the um, microphones, effectively. So now when the sound comes from this direction, it's um, exactly, you know, it's, it's delayed by exactly the wrong amount, by the, by the reverse amounts. And so it turns out that when you delay by D and add up, you can exactly cancel it. You get a, 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 pi, de, a pi radian phase shift. But of course, for a higher frequency here, it, or it actually is going to be even a smaller angle before you get this complete cancellation. So here, you get this nice main lobe, and then you get these nulls, these directions where the sound's completely cancelled, but then you get spatial aliasing, so also for this direction off to the side, you can get uh, a, a lobe of high gain, because it just happens that now D corresponds to some multiple of the number of, uh, of, of cycles. The more microphones you add, so the, you, know, you can keep making these capsules longer, and the, the greater the the gain ratio and narrower the central peak. And so this is what you get, what's called a shotgun mic, a very, very long microphone, which basically does this. It'll have a, it'll have a lot of samples of, this, of the sound waveform along the axis of the microphone, which will, it'll add up, um, which will give it a lot of gain in the particular direction. But if you ever heard a signal recorded by a shotgun mic, sometimes they're used for like surveillance and stuff like this, they have all these weird, uh, all these other sounds coming in with very weird distortion because a sound on an axis like this will have this complex filter applied where at different frequencies it's got widely varying gains. And then it, if it moves slightly, those gains will shift around. So you get these strange coloration effects. Because this is a very simple structure, we're just taking delays, you can replace these delays with filters which will have both phase characteristics, delay-like characteristics, and frequency characteristics. And you can set up this whole thing in a very nice signal processing framework. You can optimize for whatever characteristics you want. So there are ways you can trade the main lobe width for smoothness across frequency and things like this. So this is a big field of study, you know, different things you want to optimize for this kind of structure. But you know, you've got a lot of flexibility that you can apply if you've got a lot of microphones. Right? If, you've, if you've got the opportunity to actually put a lot of microphones in place and then process those signals individually, you can do a lot of things. This instant, instant, incidentally, this has a direct analog in the wireless case where you have multiple antennas, right? You have the same wireless like cell phone is a, is a very, very similar problem. You have different sources, which are different cell, individual cell phones in space. You, have mul you can have multiple microphones receiving the, radi the superimposed radio waves at different points and you can look at different ways of processing them to p pick out the individual signals or to maximize, maximize the signal to interference ratio of the different, different channels. So that's great if you've got multiple signals, but both, so both ICA and the other microphone array, array processing, they're ways of taking multiple input signals and combining them to try and pull out the individual sources. But as we said, that kind of re relies on having as many microphones as you have sources, which if you've got a lot of sources is going to get pretty expensive. Um, and people don't do that. People don't have that many microphones, but they're able to hear these sounds out pretty well. So what are they doing? Well, the simplest case you can think about is this one channel case. So now we've got no opportunity to add and subtract to cancel out between different microphones. We've just got this one microphone. What can we do? Well, if we've got a signal like this, which is like a mixture of some speech and some noise, you can sort of see that there's, there's bits of speech here. If we could just keep the bits of the signal that contain the speech and then silence out these bits in between, if we could somehow identify them as noise, then um, we'd probably we'd end up removing noise and the signal would probably sound a lot better. So what we're really talking about here is having a filter a filter that picks out just the signal parts, but that varies with time. So here, the signal parts are down in the lower frequencies, and here, they're up in this upper frequency. 
So here we want to have a kind of low-pass filter, and then we want to switch it to a high-pass filter. We want to do this all adaptively and very fast. Another way of thinking about that is to imagine the whole thing as a mask and the spectrogram. So we can say, well, the spectrogram is actually breaking up the signal into a bunch of time-frequency cells, individual cells. Um, and then I can, I can consider for each one of these cells whether I want to keep it or not, whether I think it contains signal or not. And then that gives me this sort of mask like this. And then I can basically multiply this mask by this signal and then do my inverse spectrogram, my overlap add reconstruction. And I get a signal back, which now has energy from the original signal where the mask was 1, and then is basically silent where the mask was 0, and see what that sounds like. So here's the original mixture, which is speech plus noise, which has been filtered to try and have the same average spectrum as the speech. Now, this mask I made by um, taking the original signal and comparing it to the noise and then making it one wherever the signal was stronger. So it's actually a, an oracle mask, meaning that I had to have access to the right answer before I could generate it. But if I take this mask, that's the only information I take by the original signal, and then I multiply it by this signal in inverse and do the inverse STFT. Cottage cheese with jazz. Because, although there's still noise energy coming through under these patches, because it only ever occurs when the, in situations when the speech signal is louder, we really don't hear it at all. It's like it gets completely kind of, it gets merged in with the speech signal, or it gets masked by simultaneous masking. So what we end up with is a signal that sounds very clean. Now, we've also lost quite a lot of the original speech. We sort of cut it out. Where the speech was quieter than noise, we've deleted it. But, so, but interestingly, that doesn't impact our perception too badly. I mean, when you're listening to it in, in here, there's the background noise of the air conditioning, which sort of covers up some of those holes. And so, but it, just in general, it's, it's amazing how uh, tolerant we are to deletions, of, particularly for speech, of, those, of that kind. And so it gives you a really, a really good effect. So as long as we can find this mask, we can get, we can get a pretty good separation. I mean, it depends on how loud the noise is and everything. But the trick is how we find this mask. In this case, we did it by comparing, by knowing how I constructed this mixture. But in general, you have to do it only from the mixture, and then it's a little harder, or a lot harder. It doesn't just work for mixtures of speech against some sort of stationary background noise like we had before. You can even do it for mixtures of two speech signals. So here are two voices, a male and a female voice. If I do the same oracle thing of comparing the energy at every cell, um, this plot you can't see so well. Basically, it's colored red when this one is more intense and green when this one is more intense. And then what you can do is you can just take the red cells and filter them out and the green cells and you know, mask them out. That is, set all the, so here we've set all the green cells to zero and kept the red cells. Here we've set all the red cells there and kept the green cells. And then we can do um, reconstruction for that. So here's the mixture, the starting mixture of the two signals. Don't ask me to carry it on. Kind of loud. And then here's the reconstruction of the red cells, the male voice. Why were you all weary? And the female voice. Don't ask me to carry it on. And that's incredibly effective because like these things, you know, when, when you heard them together, they're they're very much at the same level, and they're very sort of uh, closely intertwined. But as long as we can actually just pick out the energy of one and not the other, then we can basically completely remove the, the sound of the, of the competing voice. But again, I, had, I, I was basically cheating to do this, right? I mean, I, I, really didn't, I really did only start with that original signal, but I, I had this oracle information about which time frequency cell was relevant to each signal. And that's, that's the trick. So what can we use? Well, one thing we can use is the same information that we were basically exploiting when we were doing the left-right cancellation. That is the relative energy, the energy ratio between the two channels. Right? That was what the, what the microphone mixing gave us. But instead of just adding the channels and hoping that you know, one's going to cancel out and one's going to reinforce, 
we can calculate the ratio of energy in every time frequency cell and then say, okay, I'm only going to zero out all the time frequency cells except for the ones where this ratio is a particular value. So here's um, a stereo signal, right? There are two spectrograms here of a piece of music. And then here, I've taken for every cell, I've plotted the, I've calculated the inter-channel inter, inter level difference and given it a color. And what we see here, ex except when, if they're both zero, it's hard to calculate the inter-channel level difference. But as long as they're significantly above zero, I give it a color and then I get this picture here. And so it starts off and it's all mostly red, which is whatever it is, plus 3 dB here. But then we have some blue and green coming in here which is a different signal. So if I, and then I can take this mask, I can say, you know, I'm going to only keep the cells that are a particular color, and then, again, do the scaling of the spectrogram and then resynthesize, and this is what I get. At the beginning, there are some cells here that just happen to have this value. So we have some sort of, some kind of trash, basically, coming through. But then when we get to here, so you can get a pretty good isolation of the of a single part of the mix. So we'll we'll get to play with that as well on Wednesday. I've, I've written this PD patch, which basically tries to do this in real time, which is kind of fun. Um. Okay, so yeah, let me just finish this off. Um, another way you can build a mask is by, you know, a time frequency mask is by uh, saying, well, I, I think my signal is going to be harmonic. I think it's going to have a fundamental pitch and it's going to consist of the, the harmonics of that pitch. Now, if you want to build the mask, you have to pick the pitch out somehow, but, you know, that's a problem we've looked at. We've looked at pitch tracking um, and you can have pitch trackers which will work some extent, even in, with multiple signals present. So here's a, a piece of music. And then I've run a pitch tracker on it to get, basically try and get the fundamental of the, of, the, of the main vocal, lead vocal line. That's what this red line here is. And you can see it's making a few errors at different places, but mostly it's getting the right, right line. And then what I say is, well, that voice should have energy at that fundamental and then all these multiples of the, of, the, of the fundamental. So I can just pick out the spectrogram cells that correspond to those, and this is now my mask, right? So here it's sort of picking out these harmonics. You can see it's, the pitch track has picked up some vibrato here. Here's where the pitch track sort of fails and chooses a very low frequency, so the harmonics are all this block down here, etc. We can multiply this by the spectrogram and then do the inverse and get a separated signal out. So that was a pretty, I mean, this is not, this idea was published by Denby and, and Zhao in 92, and it's been, there's a lot of different variants that have been put on it. This was not their implementation. This was something I just did very quickly in MATLAB, just exactly as I described to you. Exactly how you build this mask is going to be quite important, because if you just take a single bin, when you do the inverse STFT, you're going to get nasty stuff happening with windowing effects. So there's a lot of things you can do to try and improve it, but, you know, again, just like the male and female voice example, you can remove a lot of the interfering energy just with that simple principle. A more sophisticated version of this was developed um, by Avery Wang, the same Avery Wang who built the Shazam a finger printer somewhat later. But for his PhD work at Stanford, um, he was looking at this problem. And he was basically doing a hybrid between this kind of approach of time frequency masking and sinusoidal modeling. So he, he was saying, well, I think the signal is, I think the lead signal is going to be um, a harmonic signal which means that I can model it this way as uh, a set of harmonic cosines, harmonic components, where they've got some frequency, some 
some time varying frequency, the fundamental, and then a harmonic multiple of that, so one, two, three, four times that. And then for each one of those harmonics, we have a time varying amplitude, but it's slowly varying with time. So the question is how you estimate this. And to estimate this from the mixture, he did this idea of heterodyning, which is you say, well, I, I'm looking for a component in X which is at this particular frequency, k omega zero. So you multiply by the conjugate of that complex frequency, e to the minus k omega hat zero of t times t. If there is a component x of t at that frequency, it'll be frequency shifted, right? This is a frequency shift multiplying by a sinusoid is a shift in frequency. It'll be frequency shifted down to zero, down to dc. So you just take this signal, you take its magnitude, and then you smooth that. You take a low-pass frequency of that. And that gives you a smoothly, smoothly varying amplitude estimate for that one signal. So if you do that for the, uh, for the voice here. And he had, he had clever ways of tracking omega zero by looking at this result of the heterodyning and trying to adjust omega zero to keep, keep it at a maximum. So he has a better pitch track than I was using. And so it comes out like this. You can vary, you can play around with the uh, amount of smoothing that you put in here, which will m remove more or less of the background sound. Once you've got this, you can then subtract it from the original, and you get a quite, a, quite a satisfying rest of the mix. <laughs> So you can hear the harmony vocal, which wasn't obvious before. Just at the beginning of the second note, the his, you can hear his pitch tracking is falling down a bit. So you can see there's a little bit of a schmutz in here. And then here is where that vocal comes through in, in the second channel, which is kind of interesting to hear. So this is actually, I mean, I've sort of gone over time now, so I'm going to go through this quickly. But this is kind of the, 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 the new frontier in separation, which is this idea that you, um, because you don't have enough dimensions in your problem to solve it, you need to have some other kinds of constraints which to allow you to actually find an answer for this. But, the, but we've sort of spoken about some of these constraints. These are things like, well, I think the signal is pitched. Maybe I think the signal is slowly, slowly changing in time, things like that. And you can take all of these constraints and you can try and build a model of what you think the source signal can be. And you can express it probabilistically. So you can say, well, I've got this model and now you, I can, you can give me a candidate for this source signal, this waveform, and I can tell you how likely it is under this model, the probability of that source signal. And then the problem of separation becomes an inference problem where we're trying to find the most likely set of sources given the observation that the recording's X, and you can decompose that as trying to find the set of signals that maximizes the joint probability or maximizes the factored probability, the probability of the observation given our sources and our mixing matrix times the prior probability of these settings. The prior probability of the sources is given by this model here, and then some probability for the mixing matrix, the, the A. You know, this is like the general case where we're using both spatial information and source structure. And then this thing, the probability observation given the sources is just the forward model. It's saying, well, if you tell me the, the sources and the mixing matrix, then I think that the observation is just going to be you know, the mixed version of those, but I'll tolerate some degree of noise. So this is just saying it's a, a normal distribution, a Gaussian distribution, whose mean is the mixed sources and then has some noise around that. But so now you can set this up. Um, you can, in principle, you can search across all possible source signals and try and find the ones that maximize this likelihood, as long as you've got some way of evaluating this or, or, or uh, deciding this. And so then it's like, well, what, what, what ways can we express that constraint? So there's some very recent work by Alexei Ozerov and his collaborators where they, um, they'll take a spectrogram of a source signal like this, and they'll approximate it here as the product of a, a set of spectral templates and a set of temporal activations, right? So this is, 
these are these are proper matrices that are multiplying together, and you know one particular column here is being multiplied by one particular row here to give me some part of this. But then there are multiple columns, multiple rows, they get superimposed to give me the different set of notes here. But then where do you get these things from? You can estimate them. There are ways you can just try and estimate them blindly from the source, from the signal. But you can also try and do these constrained estimations where you say, well, these spectral slices, I've got a dictionary here. I think they're probably going to be these sets of harmonics, but maybe there's some variation in how broad the bands are. Or I'm going to have a few bases in here which say they can be broadband as well. So that, the, this dictionary here is the product of this set of bases and some sparse mixing coefficients. And then the same thing for the time domain. I can say, well, it's going to be uh, a mixture of some smoothly decaying things, and then you can't see them, but there are also some impulses in here. But you can try and find some way of expressing something like this out of these bases in a sparse way. Which, and so basically, we're constraining the solution here to have a harmonic or a smooth spectrum and to have an instantaneous or a smoothly decaying time window. And you know you can play with these different things, but the idea is that you have this constrained decomposition of the signal into these sets of different time and frequency bases. And so let me just quickly play you an example. Here's a mixture, an instantaneous mixture, but of three sources recorded in stereo. And then their separation of the three components. So the drums. I want to touch you. The voice and the piano. So very high quality separations. Um, done for real. This is real blind separation based on using a good set of constraints that allow them to separate those things out well. Okay, so that's, that's the end. We talked about acoustic sources. We talked about using spatial principles to separate out the differences from different microphones using time frequency masking when we don't have spatial dimensions to work on, and then using models as a way to, to figure out what the different components are. Any questions before we wind up? All right, I'm sorry for running over, and uh, we'll see you on Wednesday.